We're continuing our studies in Chapter 13 on glucose metabolism, and in this lesson we'll be looking at gluconeogenesis. This is the synthesis of glucose essentially from scratch. It is an anabolic pathway, meaning it's going to cost us some energy. It doesn't operate in all cells. The liver primarily uses this cell to make glucose not only for itself, but for other cells in the body when glucose stores have been used. It is essentially the reversal of glycolysis. In other words, in glycolysis we took a molecule of glucose and split that to form two molecules of pyruvate. In gluconeogenesis we start with two molecules of pyruvate and we end with one molecule of glucose. In glycolysis we had ten steps and seven of those were readily reversible, near equilibrium reactions and that means that we can use them in gluconeogenesis to go in the opposite direction. But there were three steps with large negative changes in delta G and those were irreversible and so we can't ask those enzymes to reverse the reaction. Instead for those three steps and those are indicated by the black arrows here we're actually going to reverse those by four, using four steps and we need four enzymes to catalyze those steps. In our first step of gluconeogenesis, we're going to reverse the reaction of pyruvate kinase. It actually takes us two steps to do this because of the chemistry involved. We're going to start with a molecule of pyruvate and eventually we want to convert that to phosphoenol pyruvate. In the first step, we're going to convert pyruvate to oxaloacetate. So we're going to add a carboxyl group at that end carbon and that's going to come from bicarbonate. The energy to form that bond is going to come from ATP hydrolysis. So pyruvate carboxylase is a good example of a ligase enzyme. In the next step we're going to take oxaloacetate. The enzyme is phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase and we're going to remove that carboxyl group we just added and in addition we're going to transfer a phosphoryl group to the carbon number 2 position and that's going to come from GTP. So here's our product of these two steps, phosphoenol pyruvate, which is the reverse of step 10 of glycolysis. So you'll notice that it costs us a molecule of ATP and a molecule of GTP in these two steps. But remember, we need two pyruvates to form one molecule of glucose. So our total energy cost in these two steps is two ATPs and two GTPs. Now the question is, why did we add the carboxyl group in one step to simply take it away in the next step? If we compare pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate to convert pyruvate directly to PEP, we'd have to use hydrogen as a leaving group from that methyl group on pyruvate and that does not make a very good leaving group. Very poor indeed. That's why we needed to add the carboxyl group first. It makes a very good leaving group and therefore we can form the enol that we need in the PEP product. So here we are, phosphoenol pyruvate. The next several steps are all readily reversible from glycolysis. So we can use the same enzymes we used in glycolysis and just go in the reverse direction. Now when we get to the step here catalyzed by phosphoglycerate kinase, that's going to cost us ATP in the reverse. And remember we need two molecules so that's two more ATPs it's going to cost us. We'll get to the product here, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, but remember that's the product of PFK and glycolysis and that's an irreversible step. And so we can't ask PFK to reverse the reaction. For that we need a different enzyme, fructose bisphosphatase, and that clips off that phosphate to form fructose 6-phosphate. This is a very favorable reaction and represents a, an irreversible step. And so here we have our product, fructose 6-phosphate. The next step is reversible. That's our isomerization reaction to form glucose 6-phosphate. We get down to the last step of gluconeogenesis, and that correlates to the first step in glycolysis. Remember that also is an irreversible step, and so we can't use hexokinase in this step. Instead, we have a different enzyme, glucose 6-phosphatase, clips off that last phosphate, and there we have glucose. 
The question is what happens if we run glycolysis and gluconeogenesis simultaneously? What would that cost us? Well, in glycolysis, we're going to split a molecule of glucose to form two molecules of pyruvate, and we net two molecules of ATP. In gluconeogenesis, we take two molecules of pyruvate to make one molecule of glucose, and it costs us six ATP equivalents. So if both ran at the same time, we would consume four molecules of ATP, and we'd be none better. We'd make glucose, and we'd immediately break it down. So clearly we need to co-regulate these two pathways based on the cell's needs. And the control point is identical and the activator of PFK1, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, is the inhibitor of the corollary reaction in gluconeogenesis. In other words, the same metabolite, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, turns on one pathway and turns off the opposing pathway. Remember, when glucose concentration is high in the bloodstream, insulin is produced, and that stimulates the production of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which activates PFK1, and there we get all of the glucose processed. In order to make sure that we don't break it down simply to remake it, the same metabolite, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, turns off the corresponding enzyme in gluconeogenesis, fructose bisphosphatase. So again, the same metabolite turns on one pathway and off the other. So the regulation is in this reciprocal manner. In our next video lesson, we want to look at the process of storing glucose long term and how we can later retrieve that when our energy stores are low.